than ever, businesses have gone global. People no longer speak just of multinational corporations, which, like Royal Dutch Shell, operate in over 140 countries, with quarters in The Hague and in London, or General Electric, which operates in over 100 countries, with headquarters in New York City. By the 21st century, we've witnessed the emergence of transnational corporations fostered by the developments of communications. Transnational corporations take a step beyond multinationals. Their corporate cultures are not affiliated with any particular nation. Their shareholders and directorships are scattered and span the globe. Global business presents many intriguing ethical issues. Uppermost are the questions of which ethical principles, if any, are inviolable regardless of where, where you are doing business, and what ethical issues, if any, fall into a gray area where ethics varies with cultures. In this lecture, we'll consider the flexibility of ethics in a global context. We'll also consider in particular those areas where special attention needs to be paid to different cultural values. First, we need to dispense with the theory that sound ethical behavior consists in no more than a corporation's, nation's, or culture's values. The old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans, may offer some good advice, inasmuch as failing to conform to society's, society's mores may render a person a social outcast. But it has little bearing on ethics. The view that society's ethics is as good as another's is called ethical relativism, and it can easily be shown to be a false position. According to ethical relativism, sound ethical beliefs are no more than the predominating beliefs of a nation, culture, or society. Or, if you like the terms in different words, no culture has a better ethics than any other. The basic problem with position is that it confuses anthropology and sociology with ethics. Ethics is not about what a group of people happen to think is good or bad, but what is most reasonably good or bad. There are very good reasons why ethical relativism fails as an ethical theory. First off, usually ethical relativists make their case by pointing to social differences about passionate concerns, but which actually have little to do with ethics. For example, some find the burial of the dead to be horrific and cremation proper behavior, others the reverse. Tibetan Buddhists traditionally cut up a departed relative into pieces and offer it up to birds of prey for food. For many U.S. people, slicing up a recently departed relative and leaving his remains or her remains for birds would likely be utterly horrible. In such cases, it may look as if there's a different ethics about funeral practices. Actually, there isn't. There are different customs, but not different ethics. We feel deeply about the loss of people we love. We want to respect their last remains. But in fact, how their funerals are conducted has little to do with ethics as long as the funeral rites do not necessarily harm the relatives or friends concerned. Funeral practices and other sensational issues such as bizarre but non-harmful dietary choices falsely eclipse the core of cross-cultural ethical issues. Funeral practices do vary between cultures, but the ethical stature of promise-keeping and truth-telling are far more central to ethical concerns and are subject to far less variation. Why? Within a certain tradition, each one of the funeral practices mentioned can pass as ethical, whether the approach be utilitarian, Kantian, virtue, or care ethics. On the other hand, cooperative behavior falls apart when a group of people methodically lies or fails to keep promises. Consider what would happen if people methodically broke promises. Everything from contracts, marriages, and commitments to raising children, as well as every university class, as a matter of fact, offered would fall apart. Suppose promise breaking was the rule in university classes. Professors would not keep their promises to teach classes, nor would they keep their contractual agreement to assign students credits and grades. So the first problem with ethical relativism is that it seizes upon certain acts we have passionate feelings about and makes their social differences into ethical rights and wrongs. So doing it diverts our attention from the central ethical concerns about which ethics is far less arbitrary. The second reason why ethical relativism fails becomes clear if we imagine what would follow if we sincerely accepted it. Suppose one culture or society was just as good as another. All sorts of deeply held beliefs would fall by the wayside. 
We would need to give up on the belief that there has been progress in human rights, for example. We should recall that in the U.S., women were not given the right to vote until as late as 1917. Indigenous Americans, not until 1925. And isn't the extension of rights progress? Well, not if you're an ethical relativist. Consistent ethical relativists would have to say that there's no progress in human rights because one society is just as good as another. What about, about our conviction that certain leaders have rained horrors on the heads of their people? Consider the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot that murdered over one and a half million Cambodians between 1975 and 1979. Or Idi Amin in Uganda. The exact numbers of how many were murdered under his reign are not known. But between 1977 and 1979, it's estimated that somewhere between 80,000 and 500,000 people were murdered. Surely this is wrong. Yet ethical relativists, if true to their position, again would have to say no. One society is as ethical as the next. So the second main reason why ethical relativism is unacceptable is that it will not recognize there's progress in human rights. And it denies that the perpetration of atrocities and genocide is morally wrong. In fact, it will deny that there can be moral improvement or moral degradation altogether. The last reason for the unacceptability of ethical relativism is that typically it is falsified by the actions of its proponents. I encourage you, observe a friend who insists that right and wrong are nothing but the preferences of one society or another. You may then notice how they sincerely care for a sibling, spouse, parent, or even a pet. Watch how they behave if that beloved person or animal is treated harmfully, maliciously. It will be a very rare ethical relativist indeed who will not judge that action as morally wrong and likely offer a litany of reasons why it's moral. So I had a third reason why ethical relativism is unacceptable. The actions, if not the words of ethical relativists, typically indicate that they do not accept their own position. As a rule, the ethical relativist stance is hypocritical. But what about global business? The unacceptability of ethical relativism would imply that there's a core of ethical values which apply regardless of which society on the globe one is doing business with. In fact, matters are not so simple. The view that there are absolute ethical principles that demand exactly the same behavior in every society is known as ethical imperialism. In a sense, it's the flip side of ethical relativism. Doesn't the same ethics apply everywhere? Consider the following factual story. A large U.S. firm was operating in China. An employee was caught stealing. The manager did not hide the employee's behavior, but followed company policy and turned the employee over to the provincial authorities. Result? The employee was immediately executed. Well, wasn't the manager observing truth-telling and exposing a theft? And isn't truth-telling right and theft wrong? Don't they involve core values? Else communication and the right to private property collapses? In fact, the manager to some degree fell into the trap of ethical imperialism. With ethical imperialism, the problem does not lie with core values. Rather, it follows from failing to perceive correctly different people's motivations and in failing to be aware of the diverse society's public policies and laws. Applying ethical principles in an uninformed and imperceptive way in Japan, Saudi Arabia, China, just as one would in St. Louis or Philadelphia, fails to take into account how different cultures themselves evaluate moral actions. This needs to play into the application of the core values, because being aware, for example, that an employee could be summarily executed for an internal theft would lead to the understanding that the core values can play out very differently in different societies. The antidote to ethical imperialism is becoming as familiar as possible with the culture one is doing business with, so as to correctly perceive the motives of diverse peoples and to ascertain how best to realize core values. And that includes as much as possible learning the society's language. All too often we fail to understand the actual statements of people in different cultures. Understand them well enough to properly perceive the motivations or intentions of the people. As a result, we misapply ethical values. In effect, we become ethical imperialists. And this can lead to tragic results. To understand this better, we'll need to consider a very broad but significant way of marking differences between societies.
individualistic versus collectivist societies. Individualism in a society consists in the degree to which people consider themselves autonomous individuals or responsible primarily to themselves and possibly to their families. General, people in individualistic societies generally conceive and define themselves in terms of their personal characteristics and accomplishments. U.S. Americans, Canadians, Australians, and most Northern Europeans are usually classified as members of individualistic societies. Collectivistic societies. They praise conformity as a prime value. People in collectivist societies tend to define themselves in terms of their group, and they value their contributions according to the success that they bring to the group. Generally, most Latin American and Asian societies are currently grouped as collectivistic. First, some cautionary remarks about further considering how individualism and collectivism play into the application of various ethical issues in business. Stereotyping never succeeds in fairly describing a society. Canada is currently grouped among more individualistic societies, and Korea with more collectivists. Nonetheless, there are surely some Koreans who are more individualistic than some Canadians, as there are surely some Canadians who are more collectivist than some Koreans. Saying a society is individualistic or collectivist means no more than certain characteristics on the average are different. Second, we should bear in mind that any one person may shift in the cluster of traits that are called individualistic or collectivist. It's been shown, for example, how strong corporate cultures, for example, in Japan, can trump the traditional cultural differences that many people may have. A very sad clash between individualistic and, cult and collectivistic cultures occurred in the U.S. with a man of Chinese ancestry. The man, who was an inmate at a federal prison camp, spoke to students at Pennsylvania State University about the reasons why he was in prison. He explained he was highly educated. He had been a New York executive. He said he had accepted the Confucian values that one should put respect and loyalty to family first. He and his wife consequently helped his nephew. They provided the nephew with a home when he was on hard times. The problem was that the nephew was also selling drugs out of their home. The nephew was arrested and tried for drug dealing. But the couple were also accused of knowing about the drug dealing before and during the fact, and in effect supporting it. The, the result was that both were convicted and sentenced to many years in prison. As is typical of individualistic cultures, a person is responsible for their actions, provided they acted knowingly and willingly. The Chinese American men and women did act knowingly and willingly, but they believed it was their uppermost duty to help family members. It was not a question of their self-sacrifice. Rather, as they saw it, their family identity trumped their individual identity. The differences between individualistic and collectivistic societies appear especially in certain issues of business ethics. They appear especially in hiring, discipline, and in termination, and also in business negotiations and in bribery. We'll briefly consider each of these especially with reference to the differences between U.S. and East Asian practices, bearing in mind that the differences marked here might also be found in many other cultures. Take hiring, <clears throat> discipline, and termination. It's often been pointed out that Chinese and Chinese-influenced East Asian business depends not so much on the rule of law, but rather on a system of trust built upon shared identities which the Chinese call, and pardon my accent, it's surely not quite right, guanqi. This term is now common enough in the business press that it's worth looking at in some detail. Dwight Perkins, who is a professor at Harvard and director of, for 15 years of the Harvard Institute for International Development, has written, and I quote, a standard statement about business practices in China is that Americans and European businessmen show up with their lawyers and try to write and negotiate formal contracts that cover all contingencies. Chinese businessmen, in contrast, are prepared to spend years visiting, entertaining, and getting to know the foreigners before they're prepared to get down to carrying out an actual transaction with or without formal contracts. 
In fact, Perkins points to the Chinese tradition of guanji. Take a look at what the Chinese character looks like. <clears throat> now, don't be alarmed. You do not need to be able to read Chinese for this course. Um, for what it's worth, I'm wholly Chinese-less. Yet it's still worth looking at the script of this one notion. Chinese-speaking colleagues tell me that the upper character signifies behind the door, that is hidden. And the two figures on the far left and the far right, if you exercise a little imagination, do look like swinging doors with something going on inside. The lower character signifies a man facing a complex and means relationship. The figure on the far left is the standard symbolization or radical for man. And for our purpose, he surely seems to be looking at something complicated. The two characters add up to a hidden complex relationship. More specifically, Guanxi has come to mean a relationship between people based on shared identities. Now, why is Guanxi so important in Chinese business practices? Perkins explains that in Chinese history, judges seldom protected merchants. As he writes, going to the judge, and I'm quoting, was a formula for ruin in most cases, end quote. Granted, for business to operate smoothly, there needs to be a degree of trust between customers and merchants. In China, the rule of law too often would not protect this trust. So China relied instead on Guanji, trust built on shared identities. For Guanji to take place, the shared identities need not be between members of a family. They can be between members of the same village or even the same province. But they're enforced by a profound obligation felt for families. Suppose an individual banker absconds with money, for example. His family see themselves collectively responsible. The banker who took the bank's money would very likely not be able to go back to his family. He might hide out in some distant city, but without family ties, as Perkins explains, he would become a non-entity in Chinese society. Let's return then to the issues of hiring, termination, and discipline. Nepotism is the positioning of a family member in a valuable position. From an individualistic point of view, it sacrifices social equity. But it has a different meaning in Chinese business. As business ethics textbook writers Nelson and Trevino put it, in collectivistic cultures, and I'm quoting them, knowing an applicant or his or her family is considered an important qualification, and the hiring of a family member is common and expected. Now, is this practice unethical? In fact, the profound sense of family ab obligation that arises in Confucian-based collectivist cultures, such as China, gives hiring family members a different meaning. There's a different degree of family obligation that goes with the hiring of the relative that makes it not a matter of nepotism in the Western sense, but rather a matter of ensuring an employee's performance. As for discipline and termination, there are analogous concerns. One is not disciplining or terminating the individual. Rather, the action extends to the family as a whole. Indeed, the family will make far greater effort in a collectivistic society to compensate for the employee's errors than in an individualistic society. Again, in the end, the core ethical values are not essentially changed. Rather, hiring and discipline brings in a social network that makes who gets hired or disciplined more of a question of the whole family than an individual. Not the ethical values, but the subject to which they're applied is what changes. What about business negotiations? Collectivist cultures typically see the goals of ne negotiations as building of relationships. Individualistic cultures see them as occasions for conflict resolution. Is there a difference in core ethical values? Is deliberate deception and fraud any less unethical? Not really. The point is that without an understanding of the culture one is dealing with, one might misperceive, say, the reluctance of a Chinese or Japanese business person to talk about unacceptable conditions. The Japanese says, I'll consider your recommendation carefully. This in the context of Far East negotiations may be in keeping with negotiations conceived as trust building. It also may amount to, in Western terms, a no, I'm not interested. Is the East Asian business person lying? Not really. Again, the problem lies not with basic ethical issues, such as deception, 
but with a misperceiving of the styles and constraints of negotiation. Especially an issue between individualist and collectivist cultures is bribery. Now, before we consider individualist and collectivist issues regarding bribery, we're going to have to also inform you of certain legal realities in the U.S. As a result of widespread bribing conducted by U.S. corporations in the 1960s and the 1970s, it was in 1977 that the Securities and Exchange Commission passed the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. It made illegal payments to foreign political parties, candidates, and government officials so as to lead them to make business decisions they might not otherwise make illegal. This law is very much in force today. If anything, the law has been strengthened in the intervening decades. In 1995, for example, Lockheed Corporation pleaded guilty to paying a million dollar bribe to a member of the Egyptian parliament. Total fines and penalties to Lockheed in that case came to over $24 million, and a former Lockheed executive was sentenced to 18 months in prison. Bribery is unethical because it undermines the basis of the competitive market system. If a firm can win a contract through a bribe without being competitive, it can supply a substandard product at a non-competitive price. And in the selling of airplanes, for example, where bribery took place in large quantities in the 1960s and 70s, this can be great trouble. A substandard airplane can be a matter of life and death. In Chinese and Japanese societies, in which the building of trust through shared identities remains powerful mode of doing business, what looks like bribery, however, may actually be an effort to build relations of shared identities, something along the lines of an extended family. Again, it's worth reiterating that the core value, the ethical wrong of bribery, bribery is essentially not being compromised. If the so-called gift is exchanged to motivate a client who would not otherwise do business with the firm, it is a gift in name only. It's actually a bribe. But if the gift is an invitation to be part of the business person's greater family, then it has a different motivation from bribery. The business person who sees such an effort as bribery is behaving again like an ethical imperialist. What looks like a bribe in an individualistic culture in such a case are not bribes. There is a fair test for telling the difference between a gift and a bribe, sometimes called the reciprocation rule. According to the reciprocation rule, if you can't reciprocate with the same type of gift giving that's offered to you by a person whom you may be doing business, it's probably wrong to accept it. What's the rationale behind this rule? Unlike being in love or admiring someone, friendships by their nature are reciprocal. You're not friends with someone unless they're also friends with you. When gifts are presented in friendship, say so as to build family-like network of mutual obligation, guanqi, it prompts the intention to reciprocate. Quite differently, when a bribe is offered, the choice of reciprocating becomes irrelevant. Rather, it's expected the bribe will simply block the customer's choice to go with another firm. So for a rule of thumb, ask yourself, is a friendship-like bond at issue so that I would be comfortable with reciprocating the offered gift? Granted, the gift might involve expensive dinners, vacations, or bottles of fine wine, and much more. If the answer is yes, then the relation is most probably one of friendship, and in East Asian terms, the building of shared identities. If the prospect of reciprocation is irrelevant, then you should take very seriously whether the gift amounts to a bribe. Remembering that even if one is comfortable with reciprocating, one should bear in mind that accepting such a gift may appear as bribery. And for the sake of the company's reputation, one should suggest that the gift be given perhaps to all employees and not simply to yourself. Let us review then the issues we have discussed regarding global business. One, the notion that one's own group's ethical practices must be just as good as any others is called ethical relativism. Point two, ethical relativism fails as an ethical theory for three reasons. First, it tends to supplant real ethical issues with human concerns that we feel very strongly about, such as death and dying, but are not in fact ethically controversial. Second, if ethical relativism were sincerely adopted, it would make improvements or departures from ethical behavior irrelevant. 
A society that protected human rights would be no better than one that perpetrated atrocities and genocide. Third, ethical relativism does not match the actual deeds of its proponents when people they care of are at issue. Point number three, ethical imperialism is the view that one's own ethics may be applied across the board to any other culture. Four, ethical imperialism fails as an ethical theory, not because cross-cultural ethical values do not exist. It fails because it promotes our belief that we can perceive diverse people's reasons for actions in the same way that we perceive our own. Further, it presumes that a foreign society's social practices and laws are the same as ours. Point five. Societies differ by the degree of individualist and collectivist behavior. Point six. Differences between individualist and collectivist societies especially bear upon hiring, discipline, and termination. These differences also influence styles of negotiation. Although bribery of foreign officials is ethically unacceptable and illegal, given differences in individualist and collectivist cultures, what looks like bribery may be an effort to build trust through gift giving.